need to do a blinded experiment and you guessed it this hasn't happened to date yes it has here it is are you going to correct yourself on that dr bailey hey dr wilson here i'm a molecular and structural biologist and i'm back to debunk some more covid 19 misinformation and this week i'm going to be covering dr sam bailey Dr. Sam Bailey is a New Zealand doctor and a YouTuber who discusses several COVID-related topics on her channel. But recently, some of my viewers have sent me some videos of hers where she talks about PCR, and it's kind of concerning. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it broadly describes the laboratory technique used to detect SARS-CoV-2 in patient samples and help identify cases of COVID-19. PCR is one of, if not the most accurate techniques that we can use in order to detect living things or viruses in a sample. But there are several COVID deniers out there saying that the PCR test used to detect COVID-19 is flawed or useless or misinterpreted, all sorts of things. And Dr. Sam Bailey is enabling these COVID deniers by spreading misinformation about how the COVID PCR test works and how we can interpret it. So let's get started, let's hear what she has to say, and then completely debunk it. The cycle is typically repeated 25 to 40 times, and it is important to realize the exponential amplification of material that occurs with these numbers. For example, at 40 cycles, there would be around a thousand billion copies produced. However, TAC DNA polymerase has a certain number of mismatch errors, so higher cycle numbers are more likely to produce inaccurate results. This statement is misleading at best. As you can see from this example graph of what qPCR data looks like, we can see that samples that are negative stay negative even out to really high cycles. This accuracy is due to how PCR works, which I've explained in a couple other of my videos, so go check those out if you're interested. But what I'll add to it here is that when these tests are done in a clinical laboratory on human samples, they are also done alongside a standard curve which is meant to act as a positive control and help them quantify how many viral particles are in the sample. It's also done alongside a negative control, of course. So the analyst running these samples is going to be able to see all of this data and make an accurate interpretation on what's a positive, what's a negative, what's indeterminate, and what's invalid. Another important point I wanna quickly touch on here is that when people talk about cycle numbers in PCR, it always seems like they don't understand that even if a test is set to run for 40 cycles, a measurement is taken after each cycle. That means a positive result can appear at cycle 18, cycle 22, whatever. And again, the analyst is going to see at which cycle each positive result appeared. It is also important to realize that a typical PCR test only detects a small sequence of genetic material. It does not detect anything close to the entire genome of a purported organism. I've seen a lot of COVID deniers saying this same thing, and it doesn't make sense to me why she's bringing it up here, because you don't need to detect the whole genome of an organism to know that it's there. Because the portion of the SARS-CoV-2 genome that the COVID-19 PCR tests detect are unique to SARS-CoV-2, we don't need to look for the whole genome in order to say that this sample that came from this patient has SARS-CoV-2 in it, and that that person is likely carrying SARS-CoV-2 virus. The inventor of PCR himself warned that the PCR test doesn't tell you that you are sick. These tests cannot detect free infectious viruses at all. What she and other COVID deniers don't seem to realize though, is that if you look at Kerry Mullis's original patent for the PCR, it explicitly states that an application of the test is diagnostic purposes of both bacteria and viruses. So then you might ask, why did Carrie Mullis say this about PCR? Is that a fake quote? No, it's not a fake quote. But the reason he said this is that later in life, Carrie Mullis became an AIDS denier. And when he talks about PCR in this way, he's being asked questions about HIV. And he's saying that his test can't be used to diagnose HIV because, well, he denies that the virus actually causes AIDS. Yeah. The frustrating part is that Dr. Sam Bailey actually talks about this in another video of hers where she talks about Carrie Mollis' life. But when she acknowledges this part of Carrie Mollis' life where he becomes an AIDS denier, she defends him. She actually defends a AIDS denialist viewpoint. In a way, that's all you need to know about Dr. Sam Bailey. 
She actually defends an AIDS denialist viewpoint, despite the fact that the studies popping up on your screen right now definitively demonstrate that HIV does cause AIDS. But I digress, that's a topic for another video. What about SARS-CoV-2? Was it even formally isolated prior to the development of a PCR test? Yes, it was. It was isolated and sequenced. That's how the people who first made COVID PCR tests knew the sequence to target in their PCR tests. This whole denial that SARS-CoV-2 has never been formally isolated, which Dr. Sam Bailey actually harps on in this video, is just bonkers. People who question the isolation of SARS-CoV-2 don't seem to really understand the difference between what an isolate is and what purified concentrated virus is. It seems like they want a purified concentrated virus, but you don't need that in order to sequence its genome. I'll put a link in the description to a video of Dr. Vincent Racaniello over at This Week in Virology, where he explains what an isolate of a virus is. And he will show you that there have been hundreds and hundreds of SARS-CoV-2 isolates, including ones that were isolated before the PCR test was invented. We asked the groups that reported that they had identified the novel virus by electron micrograph whether they had formally purified the virus. The responses were all the same. No. Again, this is Dr. Bailey being really slimy. There is a difference between an isolate and a purified virus. And I think she knows this, which is why that she specifically asked them if they have purified it. Because of course they're going to say no. They didn't need to. It's because purification of a virus is a whole extra step, and it's not necessary to do depending on what you want to do with the virus. Even Michael Law from the Robert Koch Institute wrote in an email that we received on September 4th, 2020, I am not aware of a paper which purified isolated SARS-CoV-2. Well, here's one published months ago. Are you willing to correct yourself, Dr. Bailey? At this point, I'm getting convinced that Dr. Sam Bailey knows exactly what she is saying and is intentionally misleading her audience. The research work of geneticist Barbara McClintock is also worth a mention here. In her Nobel Prize speech from 1983, she reported that the genetic material of living beings can constantly alter by being hit by shocks. These shocks can be toxins, but can also be from other materials that produce stress in the test tube. This in turn can lead to the formation of new genetic sequences, which were unverifiable both in vivo and in vitro previously. Again, this is slimy and deceitful from Dr. Bailey. Barbara McClintock is one of my science heroes. She's one of the first women in science and Nobel laureates that I ever learned about. And I'm gonna link her Nobel laureate talk in the description so you can check it out for yourself. But basically, what Barbara McClintock is talking about here are random mutations generated by DNA damage. It's true that this DNA damage can happen depending on the environment that it gets placed in. But when people do sequencing, they do millions of reads of the genetic material and come up with a consensus sequence. Doing it this way is going to eliminate all of those random mutations that happen while processing the samples. So no, to question sequencing in this way is just completely dishonest. To prove beyond any doubt that the PCR can truly measure if a person is affected by a disease-causing microorganism, we need to do a blinded experiment. And you guessed it, this hasn't happened to date. Yes, it has. Here it is. Are you going to correct yourself on that, Dr. Bailey? PCR tests may be qualitative or quantitative. Essentially, qualitative PCR is the traditional technique which is used to decide whether a DNA fragment is present or not, whereas quantitative PCR or qPCR is used to determine how much of the DNA fragment is present in the sample. There has been confusion with regards to this as the product descriptions of the RT-qPCR tests for SARS-CoV-2 state they are qualitative tests, contrary to the fact that the Q and qPCR stands for quantitative. Here's what I don't think Dr. Bailey is understanding. Yes, the Q and qPCR stands for quantitative, and yes, the laboratory procedure does quantify how many viral particles are present in the sample. But as a diagnostic, it's not quantifying how many viral particles are in the patient. And she brings up at least one reason for this when she talks about the need to convert the RNA in the viral genome to DNA before amplifying it. 
But another thing that confuses the quantifying of how many viral particles are actually in the patient is the fact that the sample collection on the swab is not quantitative. When you collect a sample from someone using a swab, they might have a runny nose, which means you get more stuff on the sample. Their nose might be a little dry, which means they get slightly less stuff on the sample. The technician taking the sample might have a slightly different technique than another technician for actually gathering the sample. It's all kind of relative, and it doesn't give us a good quantitative answer as to how many viral particles are in the patient. Therefore, the qPCR test as a diagnostic is considered qualitative because it gives you either a yes, no, or indeterminate answer. And that's the point of PCR. It's not meant to tell you whether or not you are sick with a disease. It's meant to tell you whether or not you are carrying virus. In order to actually diagnose you with COVID-19, your doctor would have to consider your symptoms along with a positive test result. So I'll say that again. The PCR does not diagnose disease. It diagnoses cases. And that's really important. You want to know who has the virus and who doesn't have the virus when you're trying to prevent the spread of it. That seems pretty straightforward. Dr. Sam Bailey, if you want to respond to this, always feel free to contact me. We don't have to talk on camera. We can if you want, but we don't have to. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed this and found it informative. As always, the links to all the science and all the information that I talk about in this video are linked in the description, so you can check them out for yourself. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.